So welcome everybody to our Bluebeam review for architect comparisons, summary reports, and submit and signing uh, and our signing submittals webinar today. Uh, we have Ari Rechtman, our uh, AEC technical specialist and Bluebeam certified instructor here with us today to present. And while Ari Thanks. takes a look at that, I'm actually going to go ahead and launch a poll question for you guys. So if you can go ahead and answer here for us. Uh, how, yeah, have you ever used Bluebeam Review? Uh, yes, but for only for less than a year. Yes, only a few years. Yes, for over five years or not yet. Please go ahead and vote just so we can get a, a good sense of our audience here and who we've got with us. Give you guys about 30 seconds on this. Okay, five more seconds. Okay, go ahead and see these results here. Okay, so it looks like looks like almost everybody's already been using Bluebeam, which is great. We'd love to see that, and a lot of new users, which is awesome. We always we always love seeing that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alan, for your help and for introing us. Uh, once again, I'm Ari, I'm a Bluebeam certified instructor, and it'll be a pleasure to show you guys how Bluebeam Review will help you, especially since you're all architects, and it's also my specialty as a draftsman. So it will be a real pleasure and an honor to show you guys how it all works. So there was our poll question. It's good to see that we have a mixed group. So I'll show you guys some intermediate and advanced techniques, but this is a great webinar for some beginner stuff as well. So we'll go over everything that's relevant to architects, including the comparison and overlay tools, which are very useful tools, and there's some nuances to them. So I'll show you guys how they work in conjunction with one another. We'll also look at the tool chest, and I'll show you where to find some extra tools. You may have seen my web browser, and I actually have Bluebeam's website open there, where I have a lot of different tools that I found for different disciplines, especially for architects. There's also some landscaping things that'll help you all with your site plans. So we'll get into that near the end of the presentation. Then when it comes to tools, we'll look at how to use them in both properties and drawing mode. We'll also look at our markups list and see how markups automatically populate there, and we'll create hyperlinked summary reports. And if anybody needs to learn about cost analysis, I'm not going to be covering it today, but you can always contact us about that topic. It's a really, really nice one and very important. Then we'll look at how to sign documents and share our digital IDs properly. The submittal process is so vital to all of our clients, and we've been working very closely with a lot of third-party authenticated companies, such as Identrust, and so I'll show you guys how all of that works. And then we'll also learn how to automatically fill in forms with Review Extreme. There's three versions of Review, Standard, CAD, and Extreme. And you can do that with Review Extreme along with using forms and creating forms properly. So let's not waste any more time with all the introductions. Let's get right into the program. So here's Bluebeam Review. And I've already customized it to suit me for what I need. But we're not really going to get into too much customization today in interface. I've covered that in almost every webinar that I've done. And I think we're going to go straight into comparisons and overlays just to get into more of the uh, nuanced and intermediate topics. But if anybody wants to learn how to set up your interface for success, I'll give you a quick rundown. You can go to the Review dropdown, mouse over Profiles, and switch your profile from Review to Review Advanced. After you do that, come back here and click on Manage Profiles right here. And then you can essentially make a copy of your profile. So as long as it's the current profile, so Review Advanced is the one that you want to have in the background already selected, you can then click on Add here on the bottom right, and you can make a brand new one. So I recommend that you all use that as your guide. It's a really nice profile to start off with, and it allows you to see your tools and properties at the same time. And that way you can basically modify a tool in your tool chest while properties is open. So that's just a little tip, and we're not going to get too much deeper into that today. Let's get right into comparisons and overlays. So right now what I've got is, is I can see that if I go to my thumbnails list right here, I have six pages that are part of this PDF set. The second page is an older version of this floor plan without any markups. And the third page is a newer version of this floor plan with a few markups that I've added just so we can test the comparison tool. Overlays do not capture markups, so we'll see how that works very soon. So let's get right to it. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go to the review dropdown, or excuse me, the document dropdown up here. And we have compare documents and overlay pages. And you can see that there's icons to the left of these shortcuts or these functions. And so the shortcuts for them are actually at the top of my screen. They look like the A and B icon for compare, and overlay looks like two pages on top of each other. 
So let's do comparison first, and I'll show you guys how it works. Now, usually when you're using these functions, you're comparing and overlaying two separate PDFs. So I'm going to show you what happens if you try to compare different pages in the same PDF set, because there's a few uh, minor issues that happen. Firstly, I'm going to check that my document is correct. It automatically chooses whichever document is open. And if you had a second document open, it would also show up under document B. Now I'm going to choose my pages. In this case, I just want to do page two. Then I'll choose the exact same document and I'll type in the number three right here. So this is working as intended. Everything seems to be really easy now. If I needed to manually find another document, I can click on this square with the three dots right here and I can look for it. Moving down. If the entire floor plan shifted its location in the new revision, then my revision clouds would be a little bit crazy with the comparison. It would essentially think that everything changed in the sheet. But if I don't want to check that change, I just want to notice what's different inside of the building and all the little details that have changed within it, then I can use something called manual alignment. And we can use this to pick points that are similar between both drawings. So I can basically use the corners of the building, which is a great example, things that haven't really changed. And so you can do that if you need to right here. And I have a tutorial on this that uh, illustrates this. I'm not going to get into it now because my building hasn't shifted. So now I'm going to make sure that I'm using the correct comparison. I have a drop down right here for comparison type, and I've made four custom comparisons. There's also some that can come with the program right at the top right here. And so there's essentially four different kinds of comparisons we can make. We can include flattened markups, no markups at all. Uh, just markups without flattened markups or all markups including flattened markups which is usually what i use i created this by clicking on advanced right here and now we can change our settings for the comparison and if i wanted to make a brand new comparison set or uh, schema you could say i can click on this drop down right here and click on new custom i can start changing my settings and when i'm done i can click on save right here so what I recommend for you all is to change your DPI to 144 instead of the 72, which is the default. And I've included markups and flattened markups with these two boxes here, and you can uncheck them as you see fit. And I've changed my colors of my revision clouds down here. I like them to be more orange instead of red, and a few other little details here. The comparison essentially is going to make a new copy of document B, which is essentially a new copy of the newest revision of this plan. So that's usually the best way to do it. Some people like to make a, a new copy of the older one, but I think that the newer one is usually what you guys want to see in your comparison. All right, so that's looking pretty good. So I'm just going to click OK here. And I'm just explaining how this works very slowly, but really these functions, they take seconds to use, especially when they're already set up for success. So here's my comparison on the left side. And we can already use the comparison kind of by itself. What I'm going to do on my right side is I'm going to switch to page two because we essentially have page three on the left and page two on the right. So we can see the newer on the left and the older on the right. So right now we can see just by looking at this cloud here that a door was added. So that was very easy to see with the comparison tool. And sometimes we can use these tools independently from one another. But if I navigate to the right side here, and if I look at these offices, it can be a little hard to tell exactly what happened here. And this is where the overlay tool really helps us because I make a little acronym with comparisons and overlays. Compare where, overlay what. So we're going to basically use comparisons as a navigation tool. It's like our eyes. And the overlay is kind of like our brain. It tells us exactly what changed. But the overlay by itself is hard to use when in terms of navigating the document and making sure that you pick up on all the changes. So that's where the comparison has its benefits. So now I'm going to go back to the document dropdown, click on overlay pages, and let's make an overlay. This is where the nuanced issue happens because I'm using the same PDF with different pages. Usually with overlays, review expects you to use two different PDFs. And right now, the only PDFs I have open are the comparison and our regular floor plan. As a result, the comparison is right here, and I definitely do not want to use that, so I'm just going to basically delete it. Now, we've already got uh, the floor plan here. We've got page two here. The color is nice, but what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to double click on it and change that to page three. I like the newer version to be green, and I like my older one to be red. So this green color is not a default color. So when you get it automatically, try to keep it and not delete it and just modify the file and the pages when you get it. Now, you're not going to have my issue if you have two separate PDFs, so don't worry. None of this really applies in most cases, but in some cases like mine, you might want to compare two different documents in the same PDF set. Anyway, I'm now going to click on Add down here, 
it wants me to really use that comparison. You can see this is the incorrect file. So I'm gonna force it to use my floor plan again by clicking on the square with the three dots. I'm gonna locate my file. It is right here. And now I can change this to page two and it automatically chooses red as our color, which is perfect. This red is a default color. It's this one right here. It's a really nice bright red and it works very well with overlays. So now I'm just gonna reorder these just so we can get organized. So I'm gonna click on this one, use the arrows up here. So now page two is red, page three is green. This is perfect. Red is old, green is new. Let's click on edit defaults to see if we wanted to change our settings for overlay pages. Usually the settings by default are actually quite nice, but just in case you can change which contrasting colors are used first. So if I had a third set of pages to compare it to, maybe uh, if I'm comparing 25%, 50% and 75% design and development, then I could use red, blue and uh, green essentially. So that could be useful if I wanted to. If I don't like blue, I can swap it out for something else. Then under default blend, you have different kinds of overlay schemes. And the dark and default one makes sure that when red and green are on top of each other, they make black. And most of these other default blends kind of make, uh, they muddy them together and make them kind of brown. So it's a little bit uh, hard to tell what's going on and it can be a little bit uh, hard on the eyes. So you can leave your settings basically in the default right here. All right, my overlay is ready. And now I can click OK. And just like I said with comparisons, it's very easy to make overlays. It takes a few seconds, especially if you just have your files already open in review. So you don't have to worry about what I did with those pages and that. So I'm now gonna move my overlay to the right side. That way we can see the overlay and the comparison at the same time. All you have to do is just click and hold on the tab here and then you'll see little white arrows appear next to another file on that side. So I just move it right here basically. All right, so now we can use our comparison like our eyes. So I'm gonna use that and navigate on the left side and the right side is synchronized automatically. If it wasn't synchronized, I can go down here to my status bar and turn on synchronized views. And if it's still forcing me to look at the same page twice, then I can make sure that I'm either using document or page and switching between the two can help with some little issues. Now, just so you guys know, I've kind of uh, shown you guys something cool. This synchronization button, you might not see it if you've just installed review and if you haven't seen my tutorials. <laughs> so what you can do is you can turn this on along with all these other useful buttons that you can toggle on or off. I actually have these three toggled, snap to content, reuse markup tools, and synchronize views almost all the time. And so you can turn them on as well by going to the tools dropdown and mousing over toolbars. The status bar is the bar that I'm talking about and it's usually off by default. So I recommend that everybody turns it on it should be on when you install the program, but I guess to maximize viewing space, review, turn it off, and there's other ways to access these toggles, but I think this is the best way to access them. You're not gonna see these if you right click next to an existing tool group, you're just gonna see some of the more basic tool shortcuts. So that's why you need to go to tools and then toolbars to find them. Anyway, let's get back to our comparison and our overlay. So I've zoomed in here on this door once again, and yes, with the overlay, I can 100% confirm that we have a new door here. Let's go to where those two offices are and let's see if the overlay helps us. It sure does. Now we can definitely tell that the office got much bigger. So the comparison didn't really tell us that, especially where the wall here, because it essentially got longer, it seems to think that the entire wall is part of the comparison, but that's not really the case. It just so happens that these little lines in between uh, have a different spacing. They kind of shifted because of the wall size. So little nuances like that overlay is perfect for. But when it comes to locating all the differences, comparisons are superior. So for example, we can see that we now have three bathroom stalls instead of the old two bathroom stalls and a few other changes on the sheet. For example, down here, there used to be this little title here with level 02. We've now added, it seems like this little, um, maybe it's a barrier or some kind of structural thing on the ceiling that's surrounding this uh, column right here. Don't know exactly what that is. And we now can see that the comparison picked up on those markups that I created. So this is perfect. I can see where they are. And so I know that these are new markups that are, were not in the old version. The overlay did not. So the markups don't even show up. So if you have markups on your screen and you overlay, they're not, you're not gonna see them. They're all gonna be turned off for the overlay. So that's why they're not here. Okay, that's comparisons and overlays in all their glory. Let's go back to our PowerPoint and see what's next. Excellent, we're gonna get into tools and I'll show you guys some extra tools as well. Let's get into the tool chest first and we'll talk about properties mode versus drawing mode. First, I'll get rid of our overlay and our comparison. We don't need them anymore. And I can always make them very quickly if I need to. So we can go to our tool chest right here. 
And I've already added many tools to it. Just so you know, here, I'll go back to our first page so I can illustrate this. You can add a tool to the tool chest by clicking on a markup and then right clicking. Add to tool chest is here and set as default is also here. Set as default is very powerful because it allows you to set your shortcuts at the top of your screen, if they're at the top, more than likely they're here, to specific properties. So for example, if I make a text box here, I've saved it in a certain way that my text box always has a nice blue background, a blue border, and blue text like that. And by the way, whenever you're typing text in the program, just press the escape key when you're done. If you're ever creating shapes, press the enter key instead. Anyway, so I've now used this shortcut very effectively because the default text is red. And in this case, I wanted to change it on purpose. So that's how I can use these shortcuts up here effectively. And I can make sure that these shortcuts are using the most commonly used properties. And you could say that these shortcuts at the top of our screen are always in properties mode because they're not going to have a specific phrase or word. For example, when I created my text box in my tool chest here, I actually typed in text box template. You can see it on my screen. And then I added it to the tool chest. So if I double click on a tool in the tool chest, it allows me to switch to drawing mode. And this is an exact copy of my tools when I created them. So here's uh, the call out template that you see here, the text box one. Sometimes it smooshes the boxes a little bit with text. So don't mind that. All you have to do is click on them. You can stretch them out, a, a very exaggerated stretch out, which is fine because we have an automatic function to auto size our text boxes, and it's right up here. It's called auto size text box. It only appears when you select a markup. So for example, I'm gonna click outside of this, and now this fourth bar here is gone. So then if I click on the markup, here it is, along with some other formatting things that are also commonly found in properties, for example. Properties does not have the auto size text box function, so it's very, very unique to this little temporary toolbar. Anyway. So that's how we can use our markups. And most of them, if I double click on them in my tool chest, they have properties and drawing mode combined. This also applies to measurements. So uh, with measurements, it's not really useful for me to place a, you know, an exact same measurement over and over again. There might be some cases where I need to. So I don't need to create it 10 times. I can just click, 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 and I'm done. But more than likely measurements need to be in properties mode because you're gonna make a brand new measurement with new information, for example. So that's how that works. And that's why most of the time I keep my tools in properties mode. And once in a while, I have a special tool with a word or phrase that I use. And I can have multiple tools with different phrases. So I never really have to type the same thing over and over again if it's part of my workflow. So if there are, whenever I train people, I always ask them, are there any phrases or words or sentences that you guys use whenever you're marking up things? Or even labels, such as is anybody working on a civil drawing, they need to place manholes, so they type MH. So you may as well save that into your tool chest and have it ready to go. All right, so that's properties mode and drawing mode. Very nice and easy stuff. Let's go back to our PowerPoint, make sure I didn't miss anything. Yes, let me show you guys some extra tools. So I'm gonna go to my web browser right here. And we basically have this website right up here. It's support.bluebeam.com. And then you can just type review-custom-libraries up here. And when you scroll down, you have four different categories. And technically, they're all on this one page, but they just help you navigate the page easily. So if I click on tool sets, for example, now I can scroll down and I see all these different um, groups up here, all these different disciplines. So for example, we have architecture and landscape combined, with, because I guess uh, site plans are pretty common in the architectural field. And we have different kinds of symbols that are already pre-made. So you can basically click on these. They're going to be a small file. You can then double click on them and review will automatically detect them and ask you if you want to install them and then say yes. And if you're doing this and you're overwriting a, a group of tools because maybe you modified them too much and you don't want to have to uh, fix them again, then you can just overwrite a tool set as long as it has the same name. So that's how that works. And there's different kinds of disciplines here. Uh, the interior space design might be useful for you guys as well, because architecture sometimes is not just exterior. And of course, there's some MEP stuff here as well. So you guys might find some uses for that. And that's it. So that's where you can find many different kinds of tools. While we're here, I also want to show you guys stamps because it's relevant to signatures. And it's part of a new workflow that I'll show you guys with using the batch tools. If you have Review Extreme, you need to sign 50 or 100 pages or more then this is gonna be very useful. So when you're here, you can also click on stamps and scroll down. And a really, really nice stamp is this one right here, this last one, this blue one. And this stamp here actually has JavaScript involved in it. 
So when you place it, it will automatically populate things like the date, your name, especially if you uh, have a specific computer name, for example, and you can change all of that. And then you can choose whether to put a check next to approve, revise, rejected, and not revise, or not reviewed, excuse me. And you can modify this even further. So you can take this and basically make sure that your company logo is there, put some legal text down here. This is a really nice stamp. And if you have any IT specialist that's, that's familiar with JavaScript, they can help you to modify this even further. OK, great. Let's go back to our presentation, because now you guys know where to find all those extra tools. Let's go back to the PowerPoint first. There we go. All right, good. So I think now we're ready to look at the markups list and create a hyperlinked summary report. So let's go back into review. And like I mentioned, every markup automatically goes in the markups list. So I make a highlight, and I place it on my screen. It's done. Now, in order to maximize the markups list functionality, I should have it open first. So if I have a markup selected and then I open the list, I don't really know where that markup is. So if the list is open and then I click on a markup, it automatically navigates to it and highlights it. And in this case, it's literally highlighting a highlight, which is a funny joke. <laughs> so there's our markup. And it basically gives us already some information about it. So now we know the date and time it was created and all kinds of stuff. So our markups list is very, very useful. This is where you can also perform quantity takeoffs and cost analysis. So like I said earlier, let me know if you guys want some help on that. We've got a tutorial on it, and I can also work with you guys directly in a remote session. OK, so I'm going to get rid of that highlight because I don't need it anymore. And let's make a summary report. What we can do is, is we can click on this icon here. If you've sent images through your phone, You'll be familiar with this icon. It's basically like a send receive icon. So we'll click on that and we have three major options. CSV is a basic spreadsheet database that will work in almost every version of Excel and other spreadsheet programs. XML works in newer versions of Excel and other spreadsheet programs. The difference is that CSV is just basic text and the XML has some nice alternating colors and drop downs and things like that. So it allows you to sort your information a little bit easier, but it isn't necessary, but you can use XML if you want to. Usually it's more compatible with uh, more newer programs. And PDF summary is what I'm going to show you now because this allows us to create what I like to call a table of contents. And in review, we call it a hyperlinked summary report. So now that I've clicked on PDF, we have this dialog and we have this check next to append and hyperlink to current PDF. It's not on by default. So if you want to make a special table of contents that allows you to navigate to a markup as if by magic, <laughs> then you can basically turn that on. It's really, really nice. It turns every markup into a hyperlink, so to speak. So it's amazing. So we have that on. All of our settings here look fine. By the way, if you want your PDF report to be separate from your PDF, just make sure this is unchecked and you can export your PDF summary as a separate PDF wherever you want. Export to is right here and I can click on the three dots to change the file path. So I do want to make a summary report because I want to show you guys how cool they are. And then I'll go to filter and sort. I want to make sure that all the relevant columns or all the relevant um, data in my columns are turned on. For example, if I only wanted to see the engineer's markups or the architect's markups, your, our own markups, then we can uncheck everything and just check any of them if we wanted to. In this case, I want to show everything, so I'm just going to leave them all like that. Then we can go to columns, and you guys saw many different columns in my columns list. And I have more. I actually have all my cost analysis at the end on the right side. So if I wanted to, I can turn everything off and just keep, here they are, all of my cost analysis columns or whichever ones are relevant to whatever report I'm trying to create. So you don't have to show every single markup in your reports. You have the option to turn off or on certain kinds of data in these reports. All right, great. I think that everything's ready because we're going to leave most of these columns on. And let this click OK. It's now going to process. I have about 88 markups in total. You could also, at the top of that dialog, choose which pages you're going to be creating this report for. But for now, I think we've done it on all of them. I didn't quite check. <laughs> I have most of my markups on the first page anyway. So, All right, and then when this is done, we're going to see that we have new pages added to our PDF set. And it'll show us in our thumbnails list in just a second. The report is nearly done. And what's so cool is that you can just click on a markup in the report and it just takes you to the page and location of the markup and it centers it for you on your screen. It's really, really intuitive and nice to use. All right, my report has decided to lag a little bit. There we go, not so bad. All right, so let's go to our thumbnails list. And now instead of six pages, I have 31. So I have a lot of markups and I have a lot of data that I'm showing. A bit too much data, so I can only fit about two or three markups per page, <laughs> as you can see on the first page right here. 
So now I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to go to a random page in the report where I don't remember where a markup is. So maybe this one, for example. So where is Office 239? Well, I don't really know, but I can see a couple of things in the report. Of course, it says that it is on the floor plan page. So I could rename that better instead of floor plan. It could be page one, for example. And then I don't really have to read any of this because all I have to do is just click on it. So I'm just going to mouse over and click it and we're done. We're here on page one. Here is the markup right in front of us. This is a great way to navigate around stuff. So if any of your supervisors say, please show me where this markup is that you made, we need to look at it. And if you have thousands of markups to keep track of, then these reports are going to help you save so much time. And so that's how they work. That's a hyperlink summary report. All right, great. Uh, let's go back into our PowerPoint presentation. Let's see what's next. Signing, probably the number one topic that everybody needs to learn about, and I'm glad you're all here to learn it because I'm going to get very detailed about it right now. We're going to learn how to sign properly, how to use document certification and regular signatures, along with sharing our digital ID properly so that we can get all of our signatures verified, for, and, or excuse me, validated properly. All right, so before I continue, just to save on some space, I'm going to get rid of my summary reports. So I'm just going to select the, the first one, hold shift, click on the last one, and just get rid of them like that. Pretty intuitive. While we're here, I just right clicked on a page in my thumbnails list, and I have all these nice options. If you receive a PDF that has been signed by somebody else, more than likely, you're not going to be able to delete pages or rotate them or do things like that. But you might be able to do one of two things extract pages or export pages. And while we're here at export, I'll just give you guys a small little tip. First of all, let me delete these so that I don't export all of those. But I'll give you a small little tip that I've actually learned by working with some clients. If you want to export something because you need to be able to make measurements on it and the, the original file is locked out, it's not letting you make any markups or measurements. So you can go to export pages. And I'm looking for PDF, but I don't really see it. The only thing that's similar is this one at the top archive as PDF forward slash A. I don't really want to archive it, but let's see what happens when we click on it. So now I can choose a different file type here because right now it's going to become a special PDF archive. I don't want that. It actually is a similar extension to .pdf, but it has a star there for the archive. So instead, I'm just going to click on this dropdown and choose the first one, PDF files. And it also has a star, so don't worry about that star, actually. It looks like I was wrong about that. <laughs> and you learn something new every day. So anyway, this is how you switch it. And you can basically make a copy of a PDF that has no security permissions. So if you need to make measurements and the person who gave it to you doesn't really understand how security permissions work when they sign, no problem. You don't have to ask them to send it to you again. You can just make your own copy of the PDF by doing it this way. Just a little tip to help you guys out. OK, great. So let me just make sure I'm on track. Yes, signing. So now, how do we sign properly? And how to, do we sign with the batch tools properly? First, I'll show you the individual way, because this is uh, the best way to set up your signature's appearance so that you can use it properly in the batch tools. So I'm going to click on the signature right here. Now I can immediately sign. Now, what if I went to my signatures panel and I clicked on this button, Add Signature Field. By the way, I recommend you use this one instead of Sign Document. Sign Document forces you to sign immediately after creating the field. And then when you click on Cancel, it deselects the field, and you have no idea how to delete it. So if you didn't know any better, you'd kind of be stuck, and you'd have the signature field on your document forever. I'm right-clicking on it right now, and nothing is happening. So instead, the second option is best because it's very, very, very um, easy to use. And it allows you to access what I like to call form mode. Now my signature fields are a darker blue. So as a result, if I right click on them, I get similar options to a markup. So I can delete them, copy them, cut them, and all that stuff. I'll delete this one. And if I want to escape form mode without creating a signature field, all I have to do is press the escape key. So if you're all familiar with CAD and BIM programs, then you can definitely just use the escape key whenever you're done with something. So I can click on Add Signature Field, make a field, and I can make multiple. So I don't have to worry about uh, making it and then pressing Escape and canceling out of the dialog box. So you can save some time by using this function. Anyway, I'm going to press Escape, and now I'm going to sign. So I would need to log in first in order to see my appearance at the bottom and modify it. So I'm going to do that. So let me make sure I type in my password correctly. I think that's the one. Nope. I will use a modification of that. Uh-oh, let me try this one. I think this one will work. 
There we go. So after you've signed in, now, just so you know, if you have third-party authentication, such as with a company like Identrust, then you're going to sign in after you sign. So don't worry about trying to sign in here. It might already kind of be signed in for you, so to speak. Anyway, so under signature type, I have two options, digital signatures and document certification. If you just want a visual signature on your page, you can use digital signatures. However, if you need your signatures to be validated by a municipality or another company, then this isn't going to work because they can immediately invalidate your signature just by placing a markup on your page. So there's no security permissions. It's very easy to overwrite changes. You can't really overwrite um, the existing data, but you can put new data on the file, and sometimes that's unwanted. So digital signature is only for visual purposes. Now, because I'm using the sign dialog and I'm not using this button here, which is the certified document button, which I don't recommend you use very often unless you really need to, I can now combine a signature with document certification just by using a signature field. Just so you know, document certification is a background process. So when I click on certified document, everything is here except for my signature appearance. And this only allows me to use document certification. So I can do either or, or I can do both at the same time. With the batch tool, you can only do either or. So if you need to do both, then I recommend that you sign your first signature manually. And then as long as you choose under permitted changes, either the second or third option to allow for other digital signatures or even markups, then you can essentially have all your other pages signed afterwards. But I'll show you an even better way to get that done. And you can still include document certification and kind of have a signature at the same time with the batch tool. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Anyway, all my settings here look good. And if I had any legal text, I can put it under reason. I can go to edit and I can turn that on if I want to. These settings here are pretty optimal. I've turned off logo. I don't need to see the Bluebeam logo in the background. And if I have a seal, I can include it with my signature. If I don't, I have two options. I can include name, which is my name in big bold letters, and then it says digitally signed by, or to save space, especially if my seal is already coming, uh, is already on my PDF and it came from CAD or a BIM program, for example, then I can click on none. And this just says digitally signed by my name and whatever other information below it, including the date. And usually name and date are mandatory. So that's it. That's the best way to get your signature. And then I'll give you guys a little tip. If you need to use the batch tool and you're having issues with a current bug that's been going around where it tries to make the signature box very, very large and it doesn't allow you to place it properly, then I recommend you create an appearance that's empty. So for example, I have a drop down here and I have different kinds of signatures. So I have one that includes my stamp, which is the one we just saw. I have one that has my name in big bold letters. Then I have one that has no text. Uh, and I also made, I believe, this one, which is the same concept. It looks like I made it accidentally twice. <laughs> I think I was showing somebody how to make it. So this is what I've done. I just made this. I went to edit. I basically turned everything off. And the reason why I did that is because we can still have a placeholder for the signature that can be selected and validated. But if you have all your data in a stamp, you can avoid the resizing issue that's happening in the batch tool. Let me illustrate what that means right now. So let's say that I have to sign hundreds of pages. And if I have Review Extreme, I have access to the batch dropdown, which has batch sign in seal right here. So I'll click on that. And then you must save your files beforehand, or it asks you to save now, which is OK too. And then we can choose which pages. Uh, let's just say, um, yeah, we can do all six. Why not? It'll, that won't be a big deal. Now, before I get into this, I'm about to make a very big mistake. The batch tool does not allow you to rename your file before signing. So if I do this, and I've actually done this uh, twice before, <laughs> I did this recently about a month ago, I can overwrite my file and I'll never be able to modify it ever again. So if I wanna have a working file, the best practice is to make a copy of my file. So let me go back into my Bluebeam folder. I'm gonna make a copy of this file and that way, we will be safe. And you can either make a copy in the same folder with a different name, or you can just copy the file to a different folder and keep the same name. In this case, I'm just gonna type underscore original. Oh, there we go, original. And that way I know this is the original working copy. Okay, great. So now that I'm ready, I can sign this one without any fear. Batch, sign in seal, all six pages. If I wanted to add more than one file, I can click on add and not only files, but a folder with all files. I have some clients that actually have to sign and submit individual pages. And that way, if one page needs to be changed, the other pages can still stay as they are and they're still signed and validated. 
So it's actually not a bad idea sometimes to have individual pages for your entire PDF set, especially if you're mandated to do so by a municipality or a government. In our case, we don't have to do that, so I'm just gonna click on next. All right, so this is the batch sign and seal dialogue, and immediately we have some things that are checked on on the left side, and it remembered my last settings. So what I did was, digital signatures is usually almost always on, and I can change this to document certification if I wanted to, but I'm gonna leave it a digital signature for now. Then I'm gonna scroll down and I have seal down here. It's already turned on and I can include any stamp that's there, including the seal that I was using just as a placeholder. So if you have a stamp that you wanna use such as your seal as an architect, or if you have legal text that you wanna type such as, you can actually imitate the digital signature data with a stamp. So in your stamp, you can make one that says digitally signed by your name with the date and the time. And what's nice about stamps is that stamps include dynamic text. Actually, I, I, I really wanna illustrate that for you guys. I think it's really cool. So if I go and I edit a stamp, let me edit my seal, for example. That's not a bad idea. I, you can see here that we have some text here. It, says, it has the and sign or ampersand, I believe it's called, with brackets and date. If I double click in this text, I now see on the bottom left is dynamic dropdown. And if I click on that, I can now add more info. So here's time. And basically it replaces it with time. It looks like it kind of bugged out just now because it uh, put too many brackets and too many and signs. So that's okay, I can just delete those extra brackets. I think the best way to do it is to actually make sure that your cursor is on this side. And then if I do that to date, there we go, perfect. So it adds the special dynamic text for you. This picks up on the date and time from your computer so you never have to manually place it and it's very official. So now you know that this is real date and time. Anyway, I don't want to make any changes to this. I'm going to leave this as is. I just wanted to show you guys how cool dynamic text is and how you can make a stamp that imitates visually what a signature looks like. So let's get rid of that. Let's go back to the batch tools. And finally, I think we'll get into signing, but I'll explain how it works right now. So I've turned on seal. In this case, if I want my seal to be an actual seal, that's great. If I want it to be text, that's fine too. Here it is. I can move it around. It always appears in the upper left of the screen, so you can move it there. Now, I'm gonna scroll back up on the left side here, and my type is digital signature. Because of that, I actually have a box up here that is invisible, and the reason why is I'm using one of my appearances that has no data. If I change it back to my regular stamp one, here's my stamp and my text. Luckily, I'm not getting the resizing issue. It looks like my text and all my data is looking really, really clean right here. This issue happens on some PDFs. It depends on the program that you use, such as any CAD or BIM program, and some of those programs include certain data that could uh, make your PDF um, be viewed in a weird way by Bluebeam Review. And that's okay because there's ways to work around it and Bluebeam knows about this bug and has helped me to come up with a workaround while they fix it. So let's say that you know our digital signature is here and we have it ready, but let's say we don't even want that there. Let's say we wanted to do document certification while showing a visual signature at the same time. It's kind of like doing document certification with a signature, except that we're gonna use a stamp in lieu of a signature. And that's okay because it acts like the same thing. So what we can do is, is we can change our type to document certification. Now I don't have any signature to move. That signature here is gone. I just have my stamp here. If my stamp had legal data, let me switch to a stamp that I believe does. Uh, I believe that the date time one is a good placeholder. Let's zoom in so you can see it. We can pretend that I have the proper text here, but for now that's good enough. It shows today's date and the time, perfect. So you can basically, whoops, uh, by the way, if you click and hold this while zooming out, it kind of resizes it, but it's not permanent. So as soon as you zoom in again, yeah, it's. and now I can't locate my stamp, which I find very funny. Um, to reset this, I would probably want to cancel out of the entire dialogue, or I found it right there. <laughs> anyway, do not select this while zooming in and out with your mouse wheel. I tend to do that, and the batch dialogue doesn't even allow you to click the middle mouse wheel down to pan. So I'm actually panning the incorrect way with my left mouse button, and that's okay. In the batch tool, we've got to do what we got to do. And I accidentally resized it, and that's okay as well. <laughs> anyway, so you can essentially take your stamp, place it wherever you need to. And now I have everything ready. I have my stamp that has all my data. I'm certifying, so I now have permitted changes available to me. So now I can stop people from making markups, but I can allow them to sign. I've made other signature fields on this page on purpose in order for that to happen. Or I can allow people to create markups. This option is important if you're expecting somebody else to measure 
So if you want other people to measure on your PDFs, you must choose markups, fill in forms, and digital signatures because measuring tools are kind of like markups. They're, they're a different kind of markup, you could say. Anyway, let me resize this to make it a little bit smaller. And then I can just place this wherever I want. I'll just pretend that this stamp area is just for one stamp. And there it is, I've got everything I need. So now I'm gonna make sure that all my pages are correct. I'm just gonna to go to the second page just to test it. There it is, everything is the same. I don't have to worry about changing this on all pages. My stamp is in the proper location down here. So we're ready to go. And so now I can click okay. Now it's gonna process all the pages. Remember, make sure you make a copy of your file before you do this because now I've signed over the original file and I can never really undo it properly. Okay, so there it is. We have document certification on all of our pages. We also have this stamp here. Now, what's nice is that this stamp can't be selected. There's actually a setting, I believe, in the batch tools. Whoops. There's a setting to modify whether or not the stamp can be selected. And there's one more thing that you just noticed by a very good accident that just happened. How was I able to move this image? And the reason why is because I didn't flatten it before I signed. And that's okay, because it did not invalidate my signature. I can test this by going to my signatures panel right here and clicking on validate signatures. And we're going to refresh it. And looks like it says here, signature not yet verified. A little bit odd. Let's try and click on validate signatures one more time. It's funny that it says that, that error because usually I would get an error that says signature invalidated and it would show a red icon if I made any changes, which is what I did with this image right here. So here, I have an idea. Let's move the image here. Now it says signature not yet verified for the certification as well. Let's see what happens if I click on validate signatures. That's it, there we go. For some reason, it was just a little bit buggy in the signatures area. Good, so the document is certified. Everything's looking good here. The authority is me. I'll explain how third-party authentication works right now, just in case you're all new to it. So I am the second party, and the first party is any program that you're using to sign. So Bluebeam Review is the first party. I signed, this is my signature, so I'm the second party. And a third party is optional, but sometimes necessary to submit to certain municipalities. So Ident Trust is an example, Global Sign, DocuSign, these are companies that you essentially will buy a special signature from and they can help ensure that your signature is not only valid, but 100% A-OK -okay and verified by them. So that's where third-party authentication becomes very important. Anyway, so yeah, once again, now we've learned that we need to flatten all of our markups before we sign, that's very important to do. A quick way to do that is to use the select tool and make a nice box around everything on your sheet. And then you can just right click on any one of the markups and flatten them quickly. Because I did that, some markups cannot be flattened. So the flatten dialog is actually grayed out right now. So the best way to flatten and a way to give yourself a chance to unflatten if you wanted to, is to go to the document dropdown and go to flatten. And it looks like the real reason why flatten was grayed out and why it's grayed out in this dialog is because you can't flatten markups after you sign even when you use the most lenient secure, uh, security feature, which allows for markups, flattening is not allowed. So that's very good for you guys to know. Now you know to flatten before you sign. Good, so that's basically how we can use the batch tools and we can circumvent that bug. I know that it's around 2.45. I'm gonna try and pause for questions in five minutes. So let me spend the next five minutes explaining what a digital ID is and how to attach it properly. So down here, I've attached my digital ID. What is a digital ID? It is created when you create your signature. So if I was making a brand new signature, then for example, if I click on a signature field and click on new, or if I'm doing this for the first time, I can create a digital ID with Bluebeam Review or I can browse for my existing one. And so when this is created, where does it, where does it go and how do we retrieve it and put it on our, P, on our PDF? Well, we can go to the tools dropdown, mouse over signature, and we have digital IDs right here. We also have trusted identities, which I'll explain in a second. Digital IDs are where your digital IDs go. So anybody that signs on this computer will be here. So here I am, it shows me the location of my ID and I can select it and I can click on export right here. And this is very powerful because now I can essentially place this in my PC. The good news is that before exporting it asked me for my password. So not anybody can just go into my computer and export my digital ID. The other good news is that when people have my digital ID, it's okay, they don't have my password, they can't figure out any proprietary information. They only have enough information such as dates and some other computer database information to validate a signature. So it's a very safe file. Now, why am I going to this whole spiel about attaching digital ID to my screen or to my PDF? 
And that's because if you try to attach a digital ID to your um, email directly in an email, you won't be able to download it from the email. It'll actually just, it'll be there, but it'll be locked out. Your cursor will actually show that red circle with a line going through it saying, you can't even touch this thing. <laughs> so that's, that's why we have to attach it either to our PDF or another option because some people have different security permissions. You can attach your digital ID to a blank PDF because if you have really strict security permissions, you're not going to allow other people to extract a digital ID. Now I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me actually show you what I did. I went to the tools dropdown and I went to file attachment. I'm going to locate my digital ID. Here it is. It's a .cr file and it's got my name and this cool little certificate icon right next to it. And so when I want to attach it, I'm, I'm not going to attach it now, but I'll just show you this one. It initially will look like, I'll open up properties to show you, this little paperclip. And the problem with all the icons, except for the option of file icon found right here in properties, is that they keep resizing themselves as you zoom in and zoom out. So it's really hard to find them. Instead, just switch it to file icon and it becomes a fixed size and it's much, much easier to see. And I like to put it right next to my signature field. So if I had really, really tough security permissions, I wouldn't be able to go to properties and click on extract. It would actually be grayed out for me. But in this case, I can do it. And opening it is not very useful. This only allows you to install your digital ID onto your computer. Also not necessary, but third-party authentication requires it. So when you get an ID, um, a digital ID from a company like IdenTrust, they're going to essentially install it on your PC automatically so that Bluebeam Review and other PDF programs will automatically detect it. So the best thing to do, uh, let's pretend that we're on the receiving end this time. Let's pretend that we're the city that we're submitting to. They would have to click on Extract and then click on Save As. Once they save the ID to their computer, they can then put it in what's called trusted identities. So I'm gonna go back to tools and signature and go to trusted identities. And our own digital ID automatically goes in this list. This is the list for not only our own IDs because we trust ourselves and it has to be here in order to validate properly, but this is where other people's digital IDs go. So if I wanted to add somebody else's ID because I need to validate their signature, I can click on the plus sign and locate it. So if your municipality is having issues, usually it's a knowledge problem. So basically you can tell them, well, did you add my ID to your trusted identities? If you don't know how to do it, you can go to DDS CAD's website and they've got a tutorial on it. So no, you can always tell your uh, municipalities to come and check out our tutorials and many of them are our clients anyway. So <laughs> I've already worked with them to make sure they understand the receiving process. The submittal process you guys also need to understand and it's very, very important so that you guys can submit easily without any stress. Okay, great, that's how digital IDs work. Um, I don't think I left out too much. I know that we want to talk about automatically filling in forms. It's actually really quick, so I'll show you guys how cool it is. If you have Review Extreme, you're also gonna have a Forms tab. If you don't see it, just right click next to any of these major groups of functions on the left or the right. So I'm gonna right click next to the Studio icon, Mouse Over Show, and Forms is right here. And sometimes it turns itself off when you turn the program on or off. So when you go to Forms, you can ma manage all of your different form fields here. This is only available in Review Extreme, sadly. Let me go to a PDF that I love to demonstrate this on. Now, I don't know if I'll be able to because I signed this one, but I'll open up my original file and I'll do it there. Let me actually check really quickly. Yeah, it's, it's all grayed out right here. So I'm gonna close this file. I don't really need it anymore. And I'll go back to my original floor plan, what I named original. I haven't opened it yet, so I'm gonna have to go to File and Open to manually locate it, and that's not a problem. There it is. So I'm gonna to go to my thumbnails list. I'm gonna to go to this last page, page six, and I have this cool credit card authorization form. This was made about four years ago in Microsoft Word and converted to a PDF. So I basically did not make this. This was just a PDF that came from Word. And this is a great example of how cool the tool is. If I go to tools and form, I can just click on automatically create form fields. Now it does it for all your pages. So sometimes if you have a lot of pages, it takes a lot of time, but it's not a problem. So this is great because it literally placed form fields next to all the underscores and it basically labeled them properly as well. If I click on this form field, I look in my forms area and it's on page six and it's called credit card number. So it automatically took the text to the left of it and basically renamed it properly. So if you're making form fields and let's say you have a large company, Bluebeam Review Extreme can be expensive. So I recommend that at least one person gets Review Extreme, and that way you can use this functionality and it will save you a lot of time if you need to make form fields. This allows you to, of course, create your own different kinds of form fields. So we have text boxes, radio buttons, check boxes. Here, it made it noticed that these are boxes here. So if I press the escape key, 
I'm now out of form mode, so I can use the form. So for example, I can click in a form field and type data, just like that. But now these boxes are actually little check boxes. So I can just click on them and they automatically understood that they're check boxes. That's how smart this program is. So as long as you create your data properly and make it formatted in a way that review understands, it'll just automatically fill it in for you. So Microsoft Word is a good program to start off with, and there's other different programs that you can make some data with. So it works really well with what we call vector data, which is data that comes from a special program like Word, even programs like AutoCAD, Revit, things like that. So it'll work really, really well with that. And that's how it works. That's how you can automatically fill in form fields. Let me press escape a few times to cancel out of all of that. And there we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we've done it. We have now at the end of our presentation, and I'd love to answer all of your questions. Okay, thank you so much, Ari, for that. Uh, let's go ahead and get started here with our questions. First one, can I use visual search to turn lines into measurements? Can you hear me, Ari? Yes, yes, sorry, give me one second. I was having a visual bug just now. Um, can you, yes, so this is a very interesting question. The issue with visual search is, and I haven't shown it today, but let me get back into review. Uh, my screen is kind of flashing and switching programs on me, so give me a second. I think I'm having a bug with GoToWebinar. <laughs> Don't worry, this never happens with review. You can trust me on that one. Um, so let me demonstrate visual search very quickly and show you the problem because this is a, an interesting issue. So visual search is cool. You can access it by going to the magnifying glass right here. And if you wanted to turn a certain set of lines or some data that's already on the sheet, maybe some existing dimensions, into measurements very quickly, sadly, I don't think it's possible yet. So for example, I could use get rectangle here, and I could basically do it around this dimension right here. So I'm usually you would use this for things like objects, like uh, landscaping things, like trees or uh, plumbing, like sinks and, and different and toilets and things like that. But in this case, we'll try and use it with this one. So if I wanted to turn this into a measurement, I don't think I'll be able to. But let me show you guys how it works. I'm going to make sure that I have everything set up. I'm going to go to search down here. My screen is flashing again, so give me one second. Sorry about the technical difficulties, guys. This this tends to happen whenever I use GoToWebinar. <laughs> Uh, da, da, da. Let's go back here. Okay, good. So now that we're back in the program, the search is going on. It's about 21% done. It is searching just on the first page. I made sure to check that right here. And it's taking a while because this line is not really too unique. It basically has a line and then some diagonal lines at the ends. So let's see if review picks it up or not. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like it's it's. It, this is a tough example because there's too many of these duplicate lines all over the, the file. So this is actually going to take maybe too long, but I'll explain how it works. Once this is done, all the different uh, lengths, you could say, all the different lines will become objects that you can assign highlights to, you can assign hyperlinks to, and I already know how the dropdown works. What I'm going to do is to speed this up. I'm going to cancel this. I'm just going to show you guys a little demonstration of how it works. And the issue is that you can't really choose to use a, um, a measurement with it yet. But that's a really nice feature request that I want to show uh, to tell review and or to tell Bluebeam. They have a feature request section on their website that I use all the time. And I've already submitted about five or 10 different kinds of requests. And they've actually uh, implemented uh, a couple of them in the program in the, in the last year. It's really, really nice that they're looking at our feedback. So I now have, I'm just going to use it with these sinks as a little faster example. I use this example all the time. So now I can click on the, I can select all the sinks by clicking on this box here and click on the lightning bolt. And sadly, the only measurement that's available is to apply a count measurement to them. There's no way to turn them all into a length measurement very quickly or an area or other kinds of measurements. Hopefully in the future, they'll implement that. But for now, we can just use our tool chest and place them very quickly that way. So that'll probably be the best workaround. So, all right, uh, that's a good question. Any other questions? Yep, so the next one I have here, is there a way for Studio to remember my login info? Every time I open it up, it makes me sign in. Yes, that's a really interesting one. I've also been having the same issue. So what happened is that Studio, has changed their login interface. They changed it about uh, five months ago, roughly. And it doesn't remember my sign-in login either. And what's funny is that after you type in your email, I'll just show you guys 
that I'm also experiencing this. Don't worry, we're on the same page. Let me just log in here. So this is the new login area. This is completely different. I actually submitted a ticket about, about this and I got a response from Bluebeam's technical support. They're using a new server instead of the Amazon ones, they, they switched to a different one. Uh, sorry if my screen is changing right now. It's uh, flashing black and white for me right now. Uh-oh, <laughs> it's a common thing today. Maybe maybe you just want to give a a word answer, I guess, uh, on that one. We'll we'll finish out with that. Yeah. So I'll, 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 basically, there's a remember me box. You might have seen it on my screen, and you'll see it when you go to sign in. And what I what they explain is that they understand that it's supposed to remember your um your login. There. It looks like I have uh, control again. Oh, it looks like review crashed. Nice. Yeah, I think it did. Anyway. Um. So. Because the, the memory box is there, they know that it's it should remember your stuff. But for security reasons, they need to they need you all to sign in manually for now. A patch will be released very soon. It should be within about a month, maybe a few weeks. I don't know exactly when. Um, and that patch will allow it to remember your login. So sorry about you know having to make you guys do that, but for now that's how it has to be. They're going to be fixing it very soon though, so don't worry. Okay, perfect. Um, so let me just go over to that next slide for us. All right. Okay, well, thank you all again for being here today for our Bluebeam Review webinar. Um, I did again want to remind you, if you need continuing education credits uh, for the AIA, please go ahead and send in your um, your AIA number and your name to info at ddscad.com. And uh, just some other little pieces of information here. So our blog is live. We've mentioned that to you guys a couple of times. Um, so this is the, the link for our blog. If you go to the website, you can find it there as well. And we have some really good tips and tricks, things of that nature that are posted up uh, pretty regularly. And so we definitely encourage anybody who would like to go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, Bluebeam Review Training is also available. We do have a monthly uh, class, an essentials class, and then we do offer customized training as well. Uh, you can check our website for a free trial of Bluebeam Review for those that may not be using it yet. And again, for any additional info, please go ahead and email us at info at ddscad.com. All right. Thank you all for being here today and uh, hope to see you again soon. Bye. Take care, everybody.